Room 103, the junior high program, is happy to welcome you to our very first Science Gallery Night. Junior high students are happy to show you their science projects that they've worked very hard on. We've learned from the previous Gallery Nights and did our own. Every single thing that you will see tonight has been orchestrated by the junior high students, but our teacher, Ms. Sims, has volunteered to help us with technology. So now, please enjoy our very first demonstration by Tyler, doing a project about electrolysis of water. Take it away, Tyler. Hello, um, I'm Tyler, and today I'll be showing you electrolysis. Electrolysis is the process of using electricity to instigate a chemical change. For my example and experiment, I'll be using this electrolysis to separate water, or H2O, into hydrogen and oxygen. To do this experiment, you can, uh, you can do it at home, but to do uh, first, you must take all the necessary safety precautions. First of which are um, taking, getting safety gear, like glasses, and a well-ventilated environment like the outside. Another safety precaution is making sure that your hands are not dry, cracked, or wet, as this significantly reduces your body's resistance to electrical current. The next is in the items that you use. You'll need a non-metallic tub, alligator clips or wires, two electrodes or rods that conduct electricity. Um, be careful what you use for this, as um, the one that serves with the anode can rust rapidly, so like don't use your favorite screen. Um, and then also make sure not to use stainless steel, as it can release hexavalent chromium gas, which can cause cancer if you inhale too much. You also need a force of DC power like a battery. Don't use AC, as it can be deadly, and it won't work for the experiment. You also need water, distilled preferably, and an electrolyte, like baking soda. Other Substances like these acids and bases work along with salt, but acids and bases can be too strong. If they're too strong, they can be corrosive, while salt can release toxic uh, chlorine gas if uh, too much voltage is used. To begin the experiment, you start by getting out your tub and water. Fill the tub with water. Doesn't matter how much exactly. Then you can get your electrolyte in my case, baking soda, and pour it in. Um, the more of it you use, the quicker the reaction will take place. Then you can stir it. And connect your battery to the two alligator clips or wires. And then the other end, you will connect to your two electrodes. I'll be using graphite rods as my electrodes. You then place these face up inside of the tub. The closer you have your two electrodes, the quicker the reaction will take place. Um, at this point, uh, the reaction should start occurring. Um, if you uh, look closely, there will be bubbles forming on each of the two electrodes. Um, you can see that. To further illustrate this effect, I'm going to be using two test tubes. After I uh, mix in the baking soda a little more to make sure that the reaction continues. I'll be covering, uh, filling each vial with water and placing it around the electrodes. This will capture any gas that is formed by the reaction, allowing you to visualize the reaction. You can see the two test tubes. The two gases that are being formed are hydrogen and oxygen, the two elements that make up water. In the cathode, which is the negative electrode, um, hydrogen is formed. On the anode, um, oxygen is formed. This is because of uh, the chemical reactions that occur at each of these um, electrodes. At the cathode, 4H2O becomes 2H2 and 4OH. At the anode, which is the positive electrode, this 4OH becomes 2O2 
one O two and two H two O. After these two half reactions take place, you're left with four H two O becoming two H two, becoming two H two and one O two, with water being split to electricity. Um, as you can observe, the two vials are being filled with the gases. Um, the anode, which in this case happens to be the black lead, or this one, is being filled with oxygen. All this is being filled with hydrogen. You can also uh, tell which one's which by the amount of um, gas in each. There will be twice as much hydrogen for the amount of oxygen. With an H2, there are two hydrogen for every one oxygen. This is actually the method in which the ratio of the two elements of water was discovered. This reaction can be found everywhere. From the production of hydrogen fuel that fuels some carbon uh, space shuttles to the production of oxygen aboard the ISS. Thank you for tuning into my experiment. Uh, does anyone have any questions? So your first question is, what made you choose this experiment? Um, I chose this experiment because um, it's something I've done before. It was over summer a few years ago. Um, it was a really fun experience back then, and I wanted to try doing it again now that I understood more about it. And I also think that it's a really useful experiment. It's used everywhere from, as I said, uh, creation of hydrogen fuel to oxygen. Um, it's a really important scientific experiment and I really enjoyed doing it. Your second question is, what would you do to further learn about this topic? Um, I do some research online and then maybe some more experiments like this. Um, yeah, I'd see what else this electrolysis would work with. Like, um, electrolysis is also used to split minerals from the ores to separate the elements. So it sounds a little dangerous, but if I take the safety precautions, uh, I think it would be fun to further explore the topic. Thank you for listening. Um, next up is Jacob using buoyancy, solubility, uh, stick figures come to life. Thank you. Take it away, Jacob.
Hello, my name is Jacob Michaels, and for this year's Science Gallery Night, I'm going to be doing an experiment demonstrating insolubility and buoyancy. I'm sure what I'm going to do next is going to blow your mind if you haven't seen this experiment before. For the experiment itself, it's actually quite simple, really. The first thing that you're going to need is a shiny surface. I have a plate here. The next thing that you're going to need is a dry erase marker. Not a Sharpie, but a dry erase marker. I will explain later why this specific type of marker is important. So now the next thing that we're going to do is very, very complicated. We're going to draw a stick man on the plate. And there you go. That is our stick man. So the next thing that we're going to do is get our cold water. And we're going to just pour a little bit of water just outside the body of the stick man. So then, now that we have done that, now that we have done that, we can actually uh, put water all over the rest of it. And as you can see, our stick man is floating on the water, perfectly intact. And you can also move it around a little bit. So now before we discuss how this experiment actually works, uh, Let's discuss safety. As for safety, there's really no way to get hurt. I probably have a higher chance of winning the lottery than getting hurt in this experiment. <laughs> so that, uh, so how does this how does this experiment actually work? Well, there are a few things that you should know. First off, dry erase markers are less sticky than traditional markers, such as Sharpies. This is because Sharpies use acrylic polymers, which are more sticky than uh, than the oily silicon markers, than the oily silicon polymers that dry erase markers use. The next thing that you should know is that um, dry erase markers are insoluble in the water. This is why they do not. This is why it does not dissolve in the water. Finally, uh, the chemicals that make up the dry erase marker is are, is less dense than water. This is why it floats on the water. So uh, I, hopefully this short but simple experiment has taught you uh, a couple things that you didn't know about dry erase markers. And uh, I hope that you learned something new. Now, moving on to our next oh, question here. What made you choose this demonstration? So uh, it's a funny story, actually. Um, Originally, I was going to do a really cool and exciting experiment about uh, that had to do with gummy bears, explosions, and fire. Uh, but that was A, a little bit dangerous, and B, none of the materials were going to be able to arrive in time, besides the gummy bears, of course. So I had to scrap my entire project, and I had to think of a new one in just a day and a half. Uh, luckily, I was able to put this together, and hopefully you learned something from this. What happens when you pick up the stick figure? Does it stick together? No. Uh, so the stick man, will, if you pick it up, um, it will just, how about I show you? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and pick it up. And uh, as you can see, it just basically disappears and disintegrates onto my hand. So with all the questions done, let's introduce our uh, next scientist, Claire, with her soda volcanoes. Hi, everyone. My name is Claire, and I'll be demonstrating the Coca-Cola and Mentos experiment. As you, you've probably seen this experiment all over the internet, or maybe you or you saw someone else do it in real life. Well, I noticed a common, well, anomaly? I don't know. Well, I've noticed a similar pattern between everyone who has been doing these experiments or watching them. They don't actually know why this happens. So today I will be, I will be explaining why it happens, doing some fun facts for me about mentos and soda, 
and demonstrating and showing you how to do the experiment if you're if you'd like to follow along at home. So let's answer the question we've all been waiting for. Why do mentals and soda react the way they do? Well, in everything that's in soda, there's carbon dioxide known as CO2. So each mentals have these things called pits. These pits act like nucleation sites, which is the best place for CO2 bubbles to form. So the gas, once the gas it starts to come up to release quickly, it takes a look with it, giving you the giving you the soda volcano you know, or I've seen everywhere. Now that question's out of the way. It's time to do some fun fact trivia. You may answer with the corresponding letter in the chat, or you can just keep it in your head. So, first question is, how much sugar does America alone consume from Coca-Cola on average each year? A, 25.7 tons. B, 1 million tons. C, 600 tons, or D, 1.7 million tons. I'll give you five seconds. If you get them, this is really slow. It's now catching up to you. D, if you guess D, you are correct. Second question. Which soda do people thought that lukewarm would help with colds and other el elements in 1960? A, root beer, B, Dr. Pepper, C, Sprite, or D, Coca-Cola? I'll now give you time to write down your, write down your answer or type in the chat. If you guess B, you are correct. Our third question is about Mentos. So how long have they been around for? A, 21 years. B, 62 years. C, 55 years. Or D, 85 years. I'll now give you time to write down your answer in the chat or guess. If you guess D, you are correct. Our last trivia question is, who invented Mentos? A, Kiri and Michael, B, Anthony and James, C, Kat and Jay, or D, Ruth and Tony? I will now give you time to type your answer in the chat or make a guess in your head. If you guess A, you are correct. That's it for trivia. Now we'll be giving you the materials you need to complete this amazing project. So, first, you'll need a two liter bottle of soda of your choice. Then you're going to need a roll of Mentos, or well, preferably a half one, some tape and some paper, and a tarp like mine, if you would like to control the mess or see how high the see how high the volcano ex the volcano explosion went. I've already set up everything, so for anyone online who wants to follow along, I'll be reading the instructions on how to do this now. The first step is optional. First thing is to set up your tarp if you have one, however you like. Here I've hung it up, marked by feet. So I can tell how high it's gone up by the splash box. Second, what you're going to need to do is get some paper and roll it up in a tube like this. Add some tips to secure it. And then 
pour half of the Mentos inside. Then what you're going to need to do is line up your soda or sodas, how you like. And then use this to pour the Mentos in. Before we start, I'd like the audience to make a couple predictions. So you may text us in the chat or keep it in your head. First one is, which one do you think will react the most? A, Diet Coke, B, Fanta, C, root beer, or D, Sprite. Second, oh, second question is, which do you think will react the least? A, Diet Coke, B, Fanta, C, root beer, or D, Sprite. The answers will be provided after the experiment. Now it's time for the fun part, the actual experiment. So, I'll be starting off with Diet Coke first. If it's hot like this, make sure to whip. Three, two, one. All right. So, by the splash marks. We can tell that Diet Coke has reached to about two feet. Second one is Sprite. Same thing here. You don't want it to splash all over you or else, well, there goes the experiment. Three, two, one. By looks of the splash marks, it has reached to about a foot and probably about a foot and a half to a foot and three fourths. Third one, root beer. Almost messed up there. Don't want to wait too long before you put the, before you put the Mentos in. All right, three, two, one. Okay. Next. Oh. Oh. So, root beer has the measurement of over two feet, and I am going to reckon about two feet and one fourth. Next is Fanta. Orange milk. Very small. Seven. Not as exciting as I thought it would be. <laughs> okay, and Fanta has measured about a foot and a fourth. So, after all of that, root beer has reached the highest. So, if you guess root beer on which will react the most, you are correct. And if you reacted, if you chose Fanta, wait, if you chose Sprite to react the least, you were correct. Um, that concludes this. That concludes that for this experiment. Thank you for watching. And now, oh, sorry. We if, also have some questions. So. Our first question is, how would it, uh, would it react dif differently if the soda was cold? I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I have not researched that, but I believe it would make too much of a difference. I've tried it with lukewarm. I tried it with slightly more cold, but either way, I, re I received the same results. So it wouldn't affect it as much as, as, as some people think it would. 
Okay. Uh, our second question. Uh, did your results change because not all of the mentos got in the bottle? Well, for root beer, it did. It didn't change much, and it just goes to show it. It would react it, if I put them all in. If either one would react more, or it would react less. But um, for root beer, it probably would at least have a slight change, but not too much. Okay. So, third question is: How could we use? How could we use this in real life? How could we use this in real life? Well, there are many experiments out there that use the same kind of things. Well, other than you know using this for fun, you could use this to show examples of air pressure or maybe gases releasing from in tight space and how it would affect its surroundings and things like that. And you can also try it out in showing how, how it would affect with a smller, with a smaller hole you see here, or a bigger one, and showing how air pressure works. Is it the same number of mentos each time that go into the bottle? Yes. Well, except for root beer, because some fell out, but yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, now get ready for Lauren for her fire for her fire sugar snake. Hello, 
My name is Lauren Jacobson and welcome to my lab. Today, today I will be demonstrating the fire sugar snake experiment, or as I like to call it, the Medusa hair experiment. But before we get started, we have to go over the safety precautions for this experiment. One, make sure to set up this experiment outside because this experiment may create a lot of smoke. Second, have your safety goggles on. And now let's get over, go over our materials. You need sand, lighter fluid, baking soda and sugar, a mixing bowl and spoon, and a pot and pot lid. You can use an oven sheet under the pot if you like. Now, let's get started. You first have to pour your sand into the pot. Make sure it's enough to cover the bottom of the pot. Now you can add your lighter fluid. Don't put too much, but just enough to saturate the sand. Add more if necessary. Please. Stir and light it together. So it's evenly distributed. Evenly spread it throughout the pot. Now you can measure out your baking soda and sugar. You need a four to one ratio four parts sugar to one part baking soda for this experiment. In my demonstration, I will be using four teaspoons of sugar to one teaspoon of baking soda. And four. One. Teaspoon of baking soda. And we're all set. Now you have to mix it together. And now you put your baking soda and sugar mixture in a big mound in the center of your pot. Make sure it's central. And now we're ready to light it. Have adult supervision for this part. Windy weather conditions can cause it to be hard to light. Yeah, it's pretty hard to light. Yeah. Smells like a campfire over here. Mm. All right, the light. And as you can see, little black specks are starting to form on the mound of baking soda and sugar. And they're now 
setting to form the little snakes. This happens because sugar contains a lot of carbon, which means it can react to oxygen in the air. When the sugar is exposed to the open flame, it burns quickly and becomes oxidized. The sugar that is oxidized results in the products carbon dioxide and water vapor. On the other hand, the baking soda decomposes and releases carbon dioxide when it's exposed to the open flame. The surplus of carbon dioxide causes a lack of oxygen, so not all the sugar can be oxidized. Instead, it decomposes into carbon and starts to form the black snake-like structure that you see before you. Now, we're gonna let this burn for about 30 more seconds. It smells like a campfire. Kinda wish I had a marshmallow over here. Anyone have a marshmallow? And now, if you're doing this experiment at home and there's a lot of fire, you may wanna use a pot lid to extinguish the fire. You hold it over, and you suffocate it, that's it. May take a second. If it's not fully extinguished, just keep holding the pot lid over the pot. because the pot lid may start to get hot. So we have a couple questions while we're waiting for the fire to go out. Yeah. Would this experiment work the same with salt as it does with sugar? No, because of the carbon in the sugar, that's what makes this experiment work. The salt doesn't have the same amount of carbon and it doesn't react with the baking soda. So no, it would not work with salt. What's the purpose of the sand? The sand is supposed to absorb the lighter fluid to have a kind of surface for the mound of baking soda and sugar to go on. Is that something that salt could be substituted for as the sugar since salt doesn't really burn? Well, it works better with bigger chunks because it absorbs more. Could you use rock salt? instead of sand. I guess you could, but in this experiment, I'm using sand. Can you show us a closer, very carefully without burning yourself, can you show us a closer, a close up of what the snakes look like now that they, the fire's out? Yes, I can. They may form into multiple different snakes, if you look this experiment up on the internet, it may be bigger than one snake. Why did you choose this experiment? Because we learned about chemical reactions and I was interested in the science behind this experiment. Also, I was excited to show this experiment to viewers. Now, because the experiment is over, you can take your safety goggles off. Okay, next up is Nathan, testing the conductivity of liquids. Take it away, Nathan. Hello, my name is Nathan, and this is my experiment. Do you think it's a good idea to stand in a puddle of, puddle of water during the thunderstorm? Well, if your answer is yes, there, there is a good chance you'll get electrocuted standing in the puddles. Because water conducts electricity. You, might not, you may wonder why water conducts electricity. It's just H2O. 
two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Well, all water, well, water does not just contain two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atoms. Most puddles of water will contain dirt, rocks, and minerals. There is a good chance you will get ions in your water, which will conduct electricity. Today, I'll be testing conductivity and liquids. I'll be using four liquids today. I'll be using distilled water, Gatorade, lemonade, and tap water. There is a special reason why I chose Gatorade and lemonade. Lemonade is a very acidic liquid and is a good conductor of electricity. Gatorade contains electrolytes. You may wonder, what is an electrolyte? So I'm gonna to explain to you. An electrolyte is an ion that produces electricity and is good for rehydrating. All of these liquids will conduct electricity because there are ions in them. My main goal today is to find out which of these liquids will conduct the most amount of electricity. Before you start the experiment, make sure you have, make sure don't leave you two readers near your eyes because leaving the readers coming in contact with in your eye will cause severe damage. I will begin by testing my tap water. Before we start the experiment, you need a voltage, voltage multimeter, your readers, a wire, your liquids, and paper towels. I'll, I'll begin. When you do the experiment, take your battery and place your red wire on the positive side. And take your black meter and put it in your water. Once you have done that, now transfer your wire into the water. Once that is done, place your wire on the positive side and place your re red reader on the negative side. If it shows the negative side, sw switch, switch them around. For tap water, it conducted 1.21 volts of electricity. Now we will switch to our lemonade. Before we do that, we need to clean it up with a paper towel. And we transfer it to the lemonade. And we'll repeat the process. For the lemonade, it conducted 1.31 volts of electricity. Now we move on to our Gatorade. The Gatorade also conducted 1.131 volts. 1.31 volts of volts. Now, now we move on to our distilled water. For distilled water, it conducted a 1.18 volts of electricity. Out of all of these four, the lemonade and the Gatorade produced the most amount of electricity, and the two waters conducting the least. That's all it for my experiments. Do you have any questions? Hello, my name is Nicholas, and this is our experiment. Hi, my name is Jillian, and the experiment we'll be doing is a baking soda and vinegar balloon flavor. As you can tell, we'll be, we'll be experimenting with baking soda, vinegar, and balloons. We will also be testing out if it works better using more baking soda and more vinegar. This experiment is a great example of an acid-base reaction. An acid-base reaction is a chemical reaction that happens between an acid and a base. When an acid and a base are placed together, they neutralize each other. 
To replicate this experiment, you'll need to follow these steps and have these materials. But before we get started, we'd like to give out a few warnings. Please be careful while doing this experiment and do not eat any of the materials that are not edible. You will need a 1.5 liter bottle, vinegar, balloons, baking soda, and a funnel or piece of paper. Now let's move on to the steps. First, you must pour your vinegar into your bottle. Then use the funnel to fill the balloon halfway with baking soda. If you don't have a funnel, you can use some tape and paper. Then you place the balloon onto the mouth of the bottle like this. Then lift the balloon to let the baking soda fall into the vinegar. Then what does the reaction work? The balloon should start to inflate. Before we can explain what's going on, we must turn an acid in the freezer. An acid is a substance with a pH less than seven and cancels out the base. A base is a substance with a pH more than seven and cancels out the acid. What is happening is an acid base reaction. What an acid base reaction is, is when an acid and base are placed together on a neutral acid. They will react to form carbon dioxide in water and the carbon dioxide. Now we will test which one will work better. More vinegar or more baking soda. We will start off with more vinegar. Now we will test more baking soda. As you can see, the one with more vinegar works better. The reason it works better is because the baking soda dissolves in the vinegar. And when there is more vinegar, the baking soda can dissolve. In it. So it will create more carbon dioxide, which inflates the balloon more. Now it's time for questions. One of the first questions is. Is this experiment is this experiment that is familiar to you? Or this is Please repeat that question. <laughs> is this an experiment that is familiar to you? For me, it is familiar because I have seen it, but Nicholas is not as familiar with it. What made, our second question is, what made you choose to work together? We decided to work together because we are friends, right, Jane? Yeah. yeah, and we also know how to partner up very well. Next question. What was the most interesting thing you learned from this? The most interesting thing we learned from this is how an acid base reaction works and what it produces. It was it's so interesting to learn how it really inflates and to see which one works better. As you can see, the one with more vinegar works better. Your next question. How can this be used in real life? 
Well, there's plenty of things in your life which are passive and base basin. So if you know which one is which, you can maybe experiment and see an acid-base reaction for yourself. Thank you for watching our experiment. We hope you have an educational, but also entertaining. Thank you. Thank you for watching our experiment, but now it's time to move on. Hello, my name is Chloe. And my name is Kalani Lodrigeza. Today, we will be talking and showing you our project, the air pressure can pressure. There are many different ways to crush a soda can, with your foot, your hands, or your mind if you're telepathic. But nothing compares to the fun you'll be having when doing this soda can implosion experiment. If you want to do this experiment, please follow along with us and have adult supervision. The materials and directions will be to my right here. Please do not stop the experiment until we start explaining what to do. But how does a can implode, Kalani? Well, before heating a can, the can is filled with water and air. By boiling it, the water changes from a liquid to a gas. This gas is called water vapor. The water vapor pushes the air that was originally inside the can out into the atmosphere. When the can is upside down and placed into the cold water, the opening of the bottle forms an airtight seal against the surface of the bottle. This small amount of condensed water cannot exert much pressure on the inside walls of the can, and none of the outside air can get back into the can. The result is pressure of the air pushing from the outside of the can is great enough to crush it. The materials we're going to be using for this project are an empty soda can, cold and room temperature water, tongs, safety items like goggles and gloves, and a stove with adult supervision. Again, if you want to do this experiment at home, please follow along and have adult supervision. Our main question is, does the amount of water in the can affect how much it is crushed? We think that the amount of water does affect how it is crushed, but it will have to be tested. Right you are, now let's get right into it. So to answer our question, we needed to do our experiment twice. We've already finished one of our experiments. We measured the effect of a measured three fluid ounces, which is also six tablespoons. The can could hold 10.5 fluid ounces of water after it imploded. We have one control can, one we've already tested, and the one we'll be demonstrating with today. Step one, make sure that your soda can is rinsed out and clean. It doesn't have to be dried, but make sure there's no soda residue in your can. This may contradict the experiment. Step two, fill your bowl with cold water, and the colder, the better. Step three, fill, step three, add six fluid ounces or 12 tablespoons of room temperature water into the empty soda can. Because we tested with three fluid ounces last time, we need to add more water to see if it will make a difference. Now for our next step, please have adult supervision because we will be playing with fire. Well, not exactly, but we will be using a stove. So be careful and we advise you to have adult supervision. Step four, place your can directly on your stove. Ask your adult to turn on the burner to heat your can. As you see, we have already done that. As soon as you hear the water boiling and you see water vapor coming out of the can, continue heating it for one minute. After that minute, ask the adult to turn off your burner and take the can with the tongs and plunge it into the cold water. While we wait, we will ask some trivia questions. Feel free to type your answer into the chat. The can we measured three fluid ounces to put it in, imploded, and afterward held 10.5 fluid ounces. How much water do you think the next imploded can will hold, doubling the amount of water we poured in? Another question is, do you think this would work with a full can of water with no opening inside? How long do you think the water will take to create water vapor? Okay, it did not work this time, but what it was supposed to do was 
immediately implode in words like this one and make a loud bang. This probably didn't work because either this water here was not cold enough or we did not let it boil enough on the stove. Any questions? First question is, why did you guys choose this experiment? We chose this experiment because we thought it would be fun if you could crush a can without actually using any of your body parts. And also to warn you, if you wanted to try this anytime in your life, what would happen beforehand? Any more questions? What are the answers to your trivia? We have not answers to our trivia because we were expecting it to work this time, so we would measure it out. So, yeah, we do not have the answers to our trivia. Any more questions? And that was our last experiment. We hope you enjoyed the show. There were many fun, and memorable experiments that we've just watched. I know, right? We got to see snakes and fire and war. Yeah, that was so interesting. We hope you had, we hope you learned something new and exciting. Bye.